We pity your pathetic dependence on this web video for your weekly news, but here we go anyway. Today is the third anniversary of the tsunami and earth, the earthquake, then tsunami, then knocking out the power over at Fukushima, then the nuclear plant starting to go into meltdown. Today's the third anniversary. And so I think it's a good time for us to look back and see what have we learned in these past three years? What has happened over these past three years? What's the state of Fukushima right now? What's the state of the Pacific Ocean and the West Coast of the United States right now relative to that? And what's the state of nuclear power in the United States? It's a large stack of stuff to talk about when we've only got about eight minutes till the break. But Kevin Camps is with us. He can do that kind of stuff. Uh, BeyondNuclear.org is the website. He's the radioactive waste watchdog there. Hey, Kevin, great to have you on again. Hi, Tom. Good to be here. Good to see you. So, uh, you heard my list. You can start anywhere you'd like. Well, the U.S. and Japanese nuclear establishments have learned not a darn thing in three years. Uh, the Abe administration in Japan wants to turn on the 48 remaining reactors in the country. Six were done in by this disaster, the four destroyed reactors, and two more at the site that they just won't even go there because the site's so contaminated. So they retired those two. They lost six. They got 48 left. Abe wants to start them back up over the objections of a majority of the Japanese people. They've prioritized that over dealing with the Fukushima Daiichi site and the ongoing catastrophe there. It's a really powerful form of denial that Abe is in. But the same can be said of the United States nuclear establishment. As Senator Markey from Massachusetts pointed out yesterday, not a single safety upgrade has yet been instituted in the United States in response to the Fukushima catastrophe. We have 31 reactors in this country that are either identical or very similar, these general electric boiling water reactors of the Mark I and II designs. So it's an incredible disconnect between reality and this la-la land that the nuclear establishment lives in. Now, one of the things that is absolutely necessary for a nuclear reactor to run, and frankly for an oil, gas, or coal uh, electric generating system to run is massive amounts of cold water to cool the reactors. Uh, we're having droughts across much of the United States, and many of those droughts are hitting areas where you've got large rivers that are being used to cool nuclear power plants. Nu nuclear power plants are typically sited um, on a river or on an ocean just so they can have access to that cooling water. Um, are we facing any problems with regard to that? Yes, very much so. Uh, groups around the country like Southern Alliance for Clean Energy in the drought-stricken Southeast, uh, Civil Society Institute and Burma Working Group at the national level have done reports on this issue. And, uh, yeah, I mean, to give folks an idea of how much water you're talking about there, Tom, the two reactors on the Chesapeake Bay here in Maryland don't have cooling towers. They use a square mile of the bay to a depth of 14 feet on a daily basis to cool those two reactors. It's billions of gallons of water. And as you mentioned, it's not just seawater like in the Chesapeake Bay. It's also river water. It's also the Great Lakes. So this is one of the biggest, along with coal and fossil fuel centralized thermal power, nuclear power is one of the biggest single users of water in the United States. Wow. Wow. And, and it was uh, uh, the loss of cooling water at Fukushima um, because the, the pumps that, that circulated the cooling water went out because the electricity went down and the backup generators were underwater. Um, the loss of cooling water that caused the meltdown, do we have reactors in the United States that could face problems or at least have to shut down, stop operating as a consequence of drought? Well, there have been instances uh, a few days here, a few days there, even on the Great Lakes where the water gets too warm. Even on <laughs> Long Island Sound, which is connected to the ocean, the water gets too warm and it can't be used to efficiently run and cool a nuclear power plant. So they shut down until the temperatures go down. But something that's been revealed by uh, whistleblowers at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is a very endangered species, believe you me, but, you know, Praise to them for stepping up and pointing out that there are reactors in the United States, some three dozen, that are downstream of major dams in this country. And so the threat of an inland tsunami, if these dams break, those reactors at 34 different sites will be underwater as bad as Fukushima Daiichi was, no cooling. That's just one disaster scenario of cooling loss to reactors. Any loss wow. of the electric grid combined with the diesel generators and you are in a station blackout, you are in a Fukushima situation. 
So we have 34 potential Fukushimas here in the United States, at least. Oh, at least you've got, you've of course got seismic risks and tsunami risks for places like Diablo Canyon, California. Right. But ironically enough, uh, and there is a, a going battle between NBC News and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission on this one, the NRC's own documents show that Indian Point near New York City is probably the most at risk of seismic damage in mm-hmm. this country because it was so badly built. They didn't even know the fault lines were nearby back in the 1960s. They do now. Hmm. Uh, NRC is swearing up and down that NBC's got it wrong, and this battle has been going on for three years. NBC's got it right. The uh, NRC itself has admitted that Indian Point is a disaster waiting to happen if an earthquake strikes nearby. What's the status of the initial spillage of radioactive material into the Pacific from Fukushima uh, arriving at the West Coast? And what's the status of the soldiers, or the sailors rather, who were on uh, the USS Ronald Reagan that was apparently off the coast of Fukushima at the time that that reactor was melting down and those reactors were exploding and things? Well, it's interesting timing here on the third anniversary that the plume in the ocean is arriving at the west coast of North America. So the likes of Ken Buselier at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute have estimated that already the uh, Gulf of Alaska coastline of Canada is seeing cesium-134 from Fukushima. It's moving south. It'll hit Seattle as early as next month, certainly by summertime, and will move south from there just given the way the currents are carrying it. So we're seeing that now, three years later. Um, so that's a concern. What about bioconcentration in the food chain? Or has anybody found uh, cesium or strontium in, in the meat or bones of, of large fish yet? Oh, yeah. The first documented uh, cesium contamination in seafood was in uh, bluefin tuna that were swimming off the coast of North America, the West Coast, in August of 2011. It only took them a few months to Whoa. migrate across the Pacific. So... Bioconcentration, we're at the top of that food chain, unfortunately. Uh, the USS Ronald Reagan story is uh, jaw-dropping. Uh, the, the number of plaintiffs now, sailors from the USS Reagan suing Tokyo Electric is around 80. Uh, major health damage, uh, even birth defects in children that have born since uh, the last three years to those sailors. And, you know, Tokyo Electric, years late, is admitting that the levels of radioactive discharge were, were multiple times what they had admitted to in the past. So that same dynamic of doubling or multiplied by five how much strontium-90 is getting in the ocean. Wow. And uh, we're seeing ongoing releases just a couple weeks ago now. Another 100 tons of overflow in the storage tank depot hit the ground, got in the groundwater and likely flew, uh, flowed out into the Pacific. And the levels of strontium-90, which is a bone seeker, they're just off the charts, had highly radioactive wastewater. They're leaking on a fairly regular basis at Fukushima Daiichi. So it's, uh, the, the leakage into the Pacific is ongoing and has been for three years. So if it's just hitting here right now, we can expect at least three more years of continuous increases. Does that make sense? Every day, on a good day, uh, 72,000 gallons of radioactive groundwater flowing into the Pacific. These leaks from the storage depot are are in addition to that. So 100 tons here, 300 tons there. Of water. And, uh, when the uh, tempests were hitting Fukushima Daiichi, there was a lot of overflow from the uh, highly radioactive wastewater storage. Amazing. Amazing. Kevin Camps, you can read all about it at beyondnuclear.org. Kevin, thanks for the great work you do, and thanks for bringing us up to date today. Hi, I'm Ernie Gunderson from Fairwinds, and I'm out of the office again. During the three long and frightening years since the triple meltdowns of Fukushima Daiichi, the world has heard less and less about this man-made disaster. How did this tragedy happen? As the world governments continue to cover up the true magnitude of this disaster, and the mainstream media ignores it, People around the world write and call Fairwinds with their questions. The phone calls, emails, and letters ask, is most of the cleanup complete? Are the people of Japan, especially the children, okay? Are the Japanese evacuees returning home? And are the oceans okay? Sadly, the answers are no. And we're left with questions like, What does the future look like for Fukushima Prefecture and for Japan as a whole? Let's start at the beginning. 
when the fuse was first lit for the Fukushima Daiichi triple meltdowns. In 1966, during a design phase of the Fukushima Daiichi site, the American company, General Electric, made particular design decisions that impacted the Daiichi site. Over the protests of Japanese seismic and tsunami experts, General Electric decided to cut down the naturally formed cliff to a low height of approximately 25 feet above sea level in order to build its power plants. Yes, GE knew of the history of Japan's tsunamis and knowledgeable scientists protested this decision. And still, the corporation chose to cut down the natural cliff and only build a 16-foot high tsunami wall. This decision flew in the face of Japan's 2,000 years of tsunami history charting. It charted tsunamis as great as 135 feet high. Why did GE make that decision? I wasn't there. But I believe it was a decision to save money during the construction and operation of the Daiichi plant, coupled with post-World War II engineering hubris. It's that simple. Having won World War II on two fronts, American engineers believed they had the best answers to any problem facing the world, and they were intent on marketing nuclear power as a peaceful solution to the nuclear bombing of Japan. This disaster was not a new safety issue that suddenly occurred in 2011. Regulatory bodies around the world were well aware that General Electric's Mark I boiling water reactors have many operational and safety deficiencies, as evidenced by the Daiichi meltdowns. Okay, let's fast forward 45 years to the 45-foot tsunami that hit the Fukushima site on March 11, 2011. Just as the Japanese scientists predicted and feared back in the 1960s, the 16-foot tsunami defenses were totally overwhelmed when the tsunami destroyed the cooling pumps along the ocean and flooded the emergency diesels. Without cooling water, the reactors were doomed. Units 1, 2, and 3 were operating at the time and blew up, spewing radiation worldwide. The three nuclear cores melted through the reactors and spread their radioactivity throughout each unit's basement. Unlike the other reactors that were operating, Unit 4 simply blew up and its spent fuel pool almost caught fire. Radioactive cesium, strontium, iodine, and hot particles from the four reactors spread all over northern Japan as the resulting radioactive plume blew across the ocean and was measured around the world. Today, as we think about this worldwide tragedy, it's important that we recognize and remember that the triple meltdown and the multiple containment failures at the Fukushima Daiichi site were not caused by the natural disaster. The earthquake and the tsunami are what insurance companies call acts of God because they're uncontrollable natural disasters. In contrast, the Fukushima Daiichi tragedy is the worst industrial disaster in the history of the world, and it's due to inherent design flaws inaccurate risk assumptions, and the failure of every safety system designed to operate during such event. This tragedy was preventable, but corporate financial goals, world politics, and engineering hubris put money and power before the lives and health of people who farm, fished, and lived for hundreds of years in Fukushima's thriving communities. Let's fast forward once again, but this time to March 11, 2014, and focus on the fact that the aftermath of this catastrophe remains as hazardous as ever. The power plant site itself, entire sections of the surrounding Fukushima prefecture, and the Pacific Ocean are contaminated in ways humans never imagined. So no method of mitigation exists. So no method of mitigation exists. The Fukushima catastrophe will continue to be life-threatening and continue to cause extreme hardship for TEPCO employees and cleanup workers. The former Fukushima residents were homeless and being forced to return to a contaminated environment 
and to the Pacific Ocean, its habitats, and the ecosystem. The only positive event during the last three years is that TEPCO is finally moving the fuel out of Unit 4's spent fuel pool slowly, methodically, and hopefully safely. The ongoing tragic news is that huge amounts of radioactive water sit in tanks precariously placed on site and the reactors continue to, and the reactors continue to release the radioactive remnants from their molten cores into the surrounding groundwater that's migrating off site. Lastly, and of great concern to experts around the world, Tokyo Electric appears to have little control over the deteriorating environment and it behaves like a victim rather than the perpetrator of the greatest industrial mishap of all time. What will the future bring? The Fukushima Daiichi site will continue to bleed radiation into the Pacific Ocean for a hundred years. So but what I love about this story is you think to yourself as a rational person, who would be monumentally stupid enough to think that that made sense? as contaminated groundwater beneath the site slowly evolves into a radioactive lake. Decommissioning and dismantling the reactors will take many decades, and most likely complete cleanup of the entire site is at least a century away, if ever. How has this calamity evolved into such a worldwide catastrophe? It happened because the Japanese government chose to protect TEPCO its financial interests, and the goals of the nuclear power industry, rather than protecting the people who live in Japan, who travel there, and who raise and eat its food. As we at Fairwinds have said for three years now, the Japanese government must do three things. Get rid of TEPCO and tell the Japanese residents the truth about the terrible financial and radiological repercussions of this catastrophe. Admit that the cost of this nuclear debacle will be paid for by generations of Japanese citizens. And given Japan's geologic structure on an earthquake-prone island, the Abe regime should not be allowed to restart 50 idle reactors due to their failed risk assessments and failed safety systems. Radiation knows no borders. What lessons should we learn? We've learned that no matter how much electricity is generated by nuclear power, this technology has the potential to destroy the fabric of an entire country overnight. Most of all, the nuclear power debacle in Fukushima Daiichi has made it clear that businesses love nuclear power for its incredible profits, but only if taxpayers continue to subsidize its incredible risks and ca catastrophic post-mishap costs. Truthfully, the world's energy paradigm is not hopeless. Germany has made a courageous decision to eliminate all existing nuclear plants before 2022 and will not build any new nukes. Germany is known both for its engineering skill and its strong economic foresight. The people and politicians of Germany understand that they have chosen a road less traveled and are doing so to build renewable energy and an economic future rather than risk the possible destruction of their entire culture and their standard of living due to a nuclear power catastrophe like that that happened at Fukushima. Germany is proving it can successfully wean itself from nuclear power and in doing so is making a path for the United States, France, Japan, Russia, and China to follow. It's up to us as individuals if we want to help create such a change in order to protect our environment, our economy, and the health and safety of our citizens. Maggie and I and the Fairwinds team continue to dedicate our efforts to providing you and others like you around the world with accurate and timely information regarding nuclear power and its safety risks. Please pass our information along to your families and your friends. Right now, 
world governments are heavily influenced by the money and the power of the nuclear industry. It's up to individuals like you to make change happen. As the poet June Jordan wrote, we are the ones we've been waiting for. I'm Arnie Jefferson. I'll keep you informed. The 19-foot protective seawall surrounding the Fukushima nuclear power plant, owned by TAPCO, didn't stand a chance against the 45-foot wave that hit the plant three years ago today. On March 11, 2011, a magnitude 9.0 earthquake shook the coast of Japan, triggering a tsunami that created the most disastrous nuclear spill since Chernobyl. The catastrophe caused the meltdown of three nuclear reactors at the facility. Radioactive material was leaked into the air, soil, and sea, and three years later, it's still leaking. Radioactive leaks continue to plague Fukushima. New Unit 3 problem found just two months ago in January of this year. The company said the reactor has been steadily cooled, but this isn't an isolated event. In August 2013, there was a 300-ton leak of highly contaminated water. This spillage was the most severe since March 2011, and TEPCO says it doesn't know how the water leaked or where it has leaked to. Then, just two months later, in October 2013, another 430 liters of radioactive material leaked from TEPCO's plant and may have flowed into the sea. Since the start of the Fukushima disaster in March 2011, leakage of radiation-contaminated water has posed a major threat to Japan's population, environment, and economy. But just how widespread is this disaster? The amount of noxious material leaked into the ocean is difficult to know for sure, but at least 219,000 tons have been documented. Traces of the nuclear spillage are being carried far off the coast of Japan by rain, wind, and ocean currents. According to the Center for Research on Globalization, radioactive water from Fukushima is systematically poisoning the entire Pacific Ocean. In April 2011, fish were caught with radioactivity exceeding safe levels 50 miles off the coast of Japan. As a result, scientists are looking at Fukushima's role in a number of recent natural phenomena. In Hawaii, extremely high levels of cesium and radiation were found in dead tuna fish in 2011. In Washington state, millions of starfish washed up dead on the shores of Puget Sound. Biologists found one species of starfish that's literally melting on the seabed. Scientists have not ruled out the effects of Fukushima leakage in the die-off. And in British Columbia, an unusually high death rate among orca whales was reported in October of last year. Researchers also documented puzzling behavior from killer whales off the coast, including lack of vocalization and smaller traveling pods. And in Southern California, an unusually high mortality rate of sea lions was reported in 2013, sparking a government investigation that included looking at radiation related to Fukushima. After almost three years, TEPCO is still facing a major challenge to contain radioactive water at the site. Amid harsh criticism and calls to put Fukushima-related work under government control. Earlier this year, a former employee in the facility said that one of the reasons for so many leaks could be the cost-cutting measures TEPCO has applied, such as using adhesive tape on key equipment. In Washington, D.C., Perry and Boring, RT. The operator of Japan's Fukushima nuclear power plant says it might eventually have to dump hundreds of thousands of tons of contaminated water into the Pacific Ocean. It's been three years since the nuclear disaster, but TEPCO is still struggling to clear up with occasional radioactive leaks still happening. Minati has been following the disaster since it began. Technically, we're now well within the Fukushima no-go zone. We're just 10 kilometers from the nuclear power station. These houses ravaged by the tsunami in 2011 still stand here, nowhere near to being restored. One of the frightening things about this entire incident is that there are no concrete boundaries that can clearly guarantee your safety. 
hard to say what gives you a creepier feeling, the trail of destruction left by the 2011 tsunami, or the houses untouched by natural disaster but abandoned after the nuclear accident. Just to give you an idea of the consistency, right now the Geiger counter is reading 3.29 micro ringgits, which is about 30 times what is uh, more than the accepted level. But if you come down here to where the soil and the mud has collected the radiation, it quickly jumps up and it's still climbing. Earlier we got a reading of 99 micro ringgits, which is about a thousand times more than what is the accepted level of safe radiation. The place where I'm at right now, more than 10,000 people are currently living. The earthquake and tsunami which hit Japan in March 2011 led to massive radioactive leaks. Six months later, it turned out that twice as much radiation was released than initial estimates said. By October 2012, operator TEPCO finally admitted it failed to implement safety improvements that led to the meltdown. Then. A year ago, record radiation levels were found in local fish, and it was revealed three months later that the cause was radioactive water leaking from a storage tank. Well, last August, TEPCO confessed that around 300 tonnes of highly radioactive water had leaked from Fukushima since 2011. Christina Consola researches the effects of nuclear incidents, and she says the Fukushima cleanup efforts are poorly managed. Many of the things that they're doing at the Fukushima site are purely cosmetic to, um, to have the appearance that there is some kind of um, decommissioning going on. We have the massive amount of water that's being poured and collected in tanks and those tanks are failing. And so at some point a decision is going to need to be made about what they're going to do with the water in those tanks because the goal is to keep the workers on the site for as long as possible so that they can try to mitigate any problems that occur from failures in all of their systems. Thousands have been running in Tokyo protesting against the nuclear industry. The Fukushima disaster created up to 300,000 refugees. Christina Consola says that those people might never return home. According to the Japanese government, they're trying to move people back into some of those areas because they've done decontamination, which um, people who have worked on the decontamination process have stated, you know, that it hasn't worked. And we know just from bomb testing that even hydrochloric acid doesn't remove radiation. So um, I think that, you know, that that is uh, false information that's being perpetuated by the Japanese government in a way to um, try to assuage people's fears. Congratulations, you have completed this video with flying colors. Please await your certificate and complimentary fruit basket in the mail before proceeding any further. Uh, we need to get subscribed and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the remix button, hit the remix button. That way you'll have this video.